Welcome to the webinar, y'all. There may be other folks kind of signing in over the next few minutes. So um, we'll start with just some general introductions and housekeeping. First of all, uh, you all should be able to hear both myself and our other presenter today. You are able to submit questions at any time throughout the webinar using the Q&A button on the, on the bottom bar of your screen. And we will be checking those questions and answering them at the end um, after we complete our presentation. So feel free to flag anything there. There's also a chat feature if you wanted to communicate with us via that, but questions in the Q&A um, bar would be preferred. And so for those of you who don't already know me, I'm Autumn Long. I'm the program director for Solar United Neighbors of West Virginia. And I'm here today with Solar United Neighbors National Policy and Advocacy Director, Glenn Brand. So we're doing this uh, citizen lobbying training webinar to help you gain skills to be effective grassroots advocates in your local communities and to the state legislature and regulatory bodies. Um, so Solar United Neighbors is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to helping people go solar, to educating about solar, and to advocating for solar owners and solar policies. That's where we hope that you all will come in and that's the focus of our uh, our webinar today. I direct the state program here in West Virginia and we also have uh, several other state programs throughout the country. We're growing really rapidly. Uh, we're excited to be a quickly growing organization that is uh, representing the the needs and the interests of solar owners and solar supporters nationwide, as well as on the ground on the state and local level. So um, Glenn is going to take us through some general uh, lobbying skills training. And then at the end of this presentation, I'll talk a little bit more about some things that are going on in West Virginia specifically that you can get involved in right now. So thank you all for attending, for taking this time out of your lunch hour to be here. And I will go ahead and turn it over to Glenn to give you a background about solar citizen lobbying. Thanks, Autumn. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome, and again, thank you for taking the time to uh, find out more about how you can become a, an effective citizen lobbyist for solar in West Virginia. Uh, I've got you know some slides to go through, and really it's, a lot of it's common sense um, advice about how to be a good grassroots lobbyist. Um, people come to this with a lot of different kinds of experiences in lobbying. Some have never done it before and, and uh, need um, a little more support than other people who've been doing it for a while. But I think at every level, there's a, a lot to be learned about um, our collective experiences and on lobbying and what works and what doesn't work. So. That's where we're coming from. And then after I go through my presentation, if you have any questions about, about the lobbying piece or about particular West Virginia uh, issues, um, both Autumn and I will, will take those Q&As. Um, of this slide, I just wanted to make a, a firm point that solar is a really a nonpartisan issue. Um, this is uh, important. We know that solar is super popular all over the United States. Um, and um, that's not always reflected in the way that people vote, the legislators vote, um, but we are committed to a nonpartisan view of solar and that uh, we not only welcome but encourage all voices and perspectives. We really don't care why people want to go solar. Um, there are a million different good reasons, overlapping reasons, and, uh, but we really do want to highlight the, the things that make the most sense to the people we're talking to. So with that, let me advance the next slide. I um, just want to say a, a word about how we go about uh, our work at Solar United Neighbors. You know, you all know that we help people go solar. Uh, you could start this circle at any point, but uh, we help people go solar. We bring them together and we educate them about solar and we do it through our co-ops and other, other events. Um, but then we try to engage the people who've helped go solar and others who thought about going solar but didn't at that time 
uh, to fight for their energy rights, uh, specifically their solar rights. And that's a cycle that's self, self-reinforcing and builds upon itself. So that's where we're coming from. Um, the theory is really based on the idea that the people who have the uh, skin in the game, so to speak, a stake in the clean energy economy are not only highly motivated, but really compelling good advocates for clean energy policy. Uh, we work with a lot of people, um, you know, our environmental friends, our clean energy uh, industry people, solar installers, um, uh, you know, economic development people. Um, but when we engage solar homeowners, people who really have gone through the process and understand the benefits firsthand, that we have found them to make really persuasive advocates when talking to legislators. And that's the kind of thing we want to highlight, encourage you to highlight when you talk to your representatives. Uh, the unique perspective, that's, that's the key here. Um, I want to start with a definition of lobbying. You know, lobbying is a dirty word in some circles, right? It's taken on a lot of baggage and negative connotation. Um, you know, people think of it as the, the lawyer in the suit with the briefcase and, you know, about special interest. Um, but lobbying uh, more neutrally is just getting what you want by advocating to the people with the power to give it to you. So it's a common sense view. Um, it is also true that there is some negative lobbying. There is self-interest, special interest lobbying that goes on. Uh, so we want to distinguish that from what the kind of lobbying we're doing, which is citizen-based grassroots lobbying on the behalf of the public interest as opposed to private interest. Uh, a question a lot of people ask, um, you know, is does grassroots or citizen lobbying work? And uh, I won't overstate it by saying it always works, but I would say it absolutely works in many cases. And it's important to keep that perspective in mind. There's really ample evidence that citizen lobbying sways votes. Uh, most law, uh, lawmakers, not all of them, but most want, generally want to hear from their constituents and learn about the issue. Uh, they may not always agree, but they really would like to be informed of what people think. And of course, you know, behind all of this is they want to be reelected. So they, they, they want to have meaningful interactions for the most part. It's always exceptions. Um, unfortunately, most people um, don't lobby their elected officials. The lawmakers hear from very few citizens, relatively speaking, and even fewer do it very effectively. So, you know, big money is really good at lobbying, and so it's really important for, for us to um, step up and be effective citizen lobby. Uh, a couple of basics. Uh, a bill, or we'll use the word bill a lot, that's a proposed law. Uh, the process is that a bill gets assigned to a committee in the state legislature, which hold public hearings uh, before they take a vote. Um, if a bill passes through the committee, sometimes it has to go through two committees, uh, it goes to the full legislature for votes. And if it's approved um, by both houses, it's sent to the governor to sign. Uh, if the governor vetoes a bill, uh, legislators can always vote if they choose to override that veto, usually by a, a supermajority, two thirds. Okay, here are the effective citizen lobbying tactics. And you know, these, I think, are the six uh, important things to, to do. And I think they're more or less, especially the first um, four, in order of impact. Um, so calling and emailing and writing your local reps. This is an important thing to do. Um, I don't think it's as important as actually meeting with your legislator in district or, or at the state house, but it is, uh, it is important. When they hear from a lot of people, uh, they take note. Um, uh, so we'll talk about that and we'll talk about meeting with your legislator. Um, another step up, I think, is emailing testimony to committee. So citizen testimony can be emailed to committee members um, and telling your personal story can be a really effective way uh, uh, to communicate with them, to lobby them. Um, a next step up is actually taking the time out of your life to show up in person before the committee. And that has a big, pretty big impact, generally speaking. So we'll talk a little about the difference between emailing the testimony and testifying. And then the last one, which is important throughout, but I, you know, I didn't really think about this in terms of escalating importance, but writing a letter to the editor of your local newspaper can really be impactful. Um, and we'll talk about that as we go on. 
So first step is before contacting your representative, you should know something about your official's background and their, their record on solar uh, and clean energy. Uh, you can always ask us. We have access to their votes and other organizations that track these kinds of things. You can also just you know, take a look at their biography online, find out what, see if you have something in common with them, some way to connect with them. Um, the next thing is you want to prepare ahead of time what you want to stay, say, and you'll hear me say this a few times, but this is, I think, the most important thing to take away from this presentation, is you really want to start and tell your personal story about the, the way the bill in question solves a specific problem um, in your community or impacts your family or your business, your neighborhood. Um, you know, legislators hear a lot of facts about bills, uh, and those are important, and we'll certainly do that, and we'll have talking um, points for folks. Um, but um, we really feel like if you tell your personal story, uh, it'll make a greater impact than presenting facts about the bill. Uh, anyone can present the facts, pretty much, but no one but you can really tell your story. Um, when you're emailing or calling your representatives, you want to address them by their proper title. You know, if it's you know, is it representative, is it senator, is it delegates, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, and you want to identify yourself uh, by your name. Very important to tell them that they're that you are a constituent, right? What town or county or district you're in. Um, and if it's relevant to the specific issue, you would, you know mention your profession or your organizational affiliation, uh, such as um, being a member of Solar Land Neighbors. Um, and you also want to identify the bill by the bill title and number. They really organize the information that way, and so we can provide that, that information. Um, you want to briefly state, now again, this is in a phone call or an email, uh, briefly state how you want your representative to vote. You really want to lead with that, right? Uh, I'm here to uh, talk about this bill, and I, we're, um, we're looking to you to support the bill. That's I'm asking for your support. You want to make an explicit ask. And then you want to say how the bill would affect you personally or your community, your business. Um, if you hear back from your, in an email or on the phone from your representative and it's not what you want to hear, they're opposing our position, your position, you want to get into the habit, even if you feel angry, but get in the habit of expressing disappointment. Um, because we don't want the conversation to end there. Um, you can offer to answer questions or supply additional information. One trick I always use, uh, both in-person meetings and in this situation where you're emailing or calling, is I ask, well, what, what kind of information will you need to uh, reconsider your position? And that puts it back to them to say, well, if you could show me it's going to create lots of jobs in my district, I might think about it, or whatever their answer is. And then we can get back to us and we can help you provide that information if, if we can get it. Um, so you want to think about it as building a relationship rather than sort of a one-off communication. Um, then the next piece is to make sure you follow up as quickly as possible with an email or if it's appropriate a phone call with the information. And you also want to again restate your position and ask for their vote. Um, a couple more tips. You want to be sort of politely assertive is the phrase I like to use and use a professional tone. I mean, obviously, if you know them well, it can be more relaxed or informal, but it, it, most people don't really have to know them personally. So you want, you want to have a professional tone, but you also don't want to be a wallflower. You really want to assert yourself and say, this is what I'd, we'd like to see, and here's why. And I think uh, I said this before, but one of the goals of this communication is you're building an ongoing and productive relationship with your representative. It's not just simply something you're asking or demanding now. Um, it is the case that sometimes our, even our best uh, friends in the legislature don't do what we want. It happens a lot. So we want to be able to go back and forth and say, um, you know, disappointing you weren't with us on that one, but here's another opportunity. That, that's the kind of tone I think is most effective. Um, the next step up is meeting in person with your representative. And I think by far this is the most impactful of the lot. Um, you want to request the meeting at least uh, a week ahead. And you want to meet either at their legislative office if it's possible and you live in a place where you could you know, near that. 
um, or in district. You can always ask for an in district meeting. That is in, in your, where both you and the, your representative live. Um, you simply have to just give them a call uh, and, and ask and say what you want to meet about and set up an appointment. Um, if your legislator is not available, uh, don't let it end there. Say, well, um, I'd like to meet with a staffer instead. And that is good because staffers, one of their main jobs is to take good notes at meetings and convey what happened during that meeting. So it is not as good, but it is still an effective way to, to lobby is to talk to the staff. Um, again, when you prepare for the meeting, you're going to do the same kinds of things uh, that I suggested when calling or emailing your representative. Um, uh, you know, you'll, you'll find out who they are, you'll find out a little about their background, you'll make those specific asks, you'll identify the bill, and all of that sort of thing. Um, it's a good idea to have a one-page outline of your talking points, not that you're going to read from the piece of paper, but just so you can consult it as you go on. Um, one thing that a lot of people do is they bring a lot of written material to leave with legislators and, and they really don't read, read them unless it's really short. And so we recommend one to two pages maximum. And you don't want to bring them a, 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 something you printed out from the internet, an essay. Uh, they simply, um, in most cases, will, will not read it. Even if they're interested, they, they do have a lot of uh, uh, material to review. Um, one of the things that I have a problem with, and I think other people who do lobbying, it's a challenge for them, is talking too much. Now you're in a meeting and you want to get your ideas out and you keep talking, 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 and you want to make, you know, you know it's a 15, 20 minute meeting, and you just want to make sure you get to say what you want to say. But it is very important to consciously allow opportunity for the legislators to, to talk and to speak about their positions and mostly their concerns. Often the conversation will be about, well, I see your point, but I am concerned that. And they'll explain what their fears are about the bill or what they've heard. And that's where you want to learn about where they're coming from. And that's how we can best respond to their concerns. So sometimes that means asking them direct questions. Where do you stand on this? And then wait for them to answer. A lot of time it's to have a little bit of that uncomfortable silence and uh, make sure that they talk. I do think it's a good idea to take notes. Um, if you're with, a, a, if you meet with your legislator with a couple of people, or three, three, four people, and to assign somebody to take notes as long as it's not too distracting. Uh, it's a common practice. Um, if they ask you a question and you don't know what the answer is, just say so off the, off the bat. Say, I don't know, but I will find out the answer and get it back. That's the way to do this. And you can get back to Autumn and, and uh, we'll help you find that specific answer to that question to our best ability, or you can find out who, who can answer that. And so that's the kind of work that we, support we can provide you. Um, you wanna close the meeting formally by thanking the rep for the meeting and say you're gonna follow up. And then of course, you need to follow up. If, if, again, they directly look at you in the face and say, um, no, I don't agree with you, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to support your position. Again, you can say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, and, you know, the disappointment, not anger uh, piece. And really, again, ask them, what do you need to get to come around? Like, you know, it, there, that way it opens up a conversation and um, uh, they, the onus is on them to say something that we can respond to. And then say, great, uh, we'll do our best to send you information to address that concern. Um, we're here for you. Uh, right after the meeting, I think it's a really good idea just to sit down with your, uh, the, the people that you came with, or if it's a, a meeting you did alone with the rep, uh, and review your notes. Because I often look at my notes and I can't remember uh, the day later exactly what I meant. I scribbled it. Uh, so review your notes, clarify your notes. And then I think it's just a good habit to immediately, as soon as possible, send that follow-up email. And this doesn't have to be more than two, three sentences. Uh, say, thanks for the time to, to meet. Um, you know, appreciate your support, right? <laughs> or um, uh, sorry that, you know, we're sorry to hear you're not going to support us. But here's some information that, um, uh, uh, that you were asking for. And I think it's important to explicitly repeat your ask again. Say, look, we really want you to consider voting when this comes down to the floor or in committee. Um, 
I mentioned if they say they will support, you have a meeting and you know, we meet with the people that we uh, think are gonna agree with us as well as the people we think we're on the fence and those who disagree with us or often. Um, if they say, yeah, I'm with you on this, I intend to vote for this bill, say, wonderful, thank you, and then urge them to encourage their colleagues to follow suit. You could also ask, uh, you could ask Autumn if this is the right strategy, but at most of the time, it's, there's no harm in saying, I'm glad you're gonna vote for it. Would you consider being a co-sponsor for the bill? That's another layer of support. Um, and that also, the more, uh, generally, the bill that has more co-sponsors has a better chance. Okay, I want to close by talking about writing letters to the editor. This is the kind of thing that you hear people advise people to do a lot. And I want to make a case that it really is a kind of a simple and really effective way to lobby. Um, one of the things you may not know, um, before I go through this, you may not know that legislators pay very careful attention to letters to the editor. Um, particularly in local newspapers. Of course, they're gonna look at, at the, the state level newspapers, the big papers, um, but they also pay attention to the, the weeklies, the ones that everybody in the community reads. Um, they're easier to get letters to the editor in those because those make newspapers come out frequently and they also need lots of content. Um, and so uh, I think you should take advantage of, of this opportunity. And there's a couple of, of tricks for it. Number one, before you even write in a letter to the editor, you, know, you want to check the newspaper's word count limits. Uh, they're sometimes very brief, 100, 150 words. You can't say much there. You've got to be very concise. Sometimes they, there, there isn't one, um, you know, but it will be three, 350 or something like that. Um, so you don't want to spend some time writing something and then find out that you, know, you have to cut, cut it out. Um, you want to very upfront, you want to identify the bill in question. Uh, you know, again, the title of the bill uh, and um, the uh, bill number. Explain why it's important to you and very in particular to the community that you live in. And you want to call, and this is really important, you want to call on your local legislators by name to support the position. That's when they'll pay attention. When their name shows up in the newspaper, they have staff or they themselves clip it out and pay attention. Um, there's some of them have rules of thumb, you know, one letter to the editor equals, you know, X amount of support in the community, uh, whether that's true or not. I'm not sure. um, one trick to, to, to encourage the, your newspaper to uh, publish your letter is to tie it to an article um, in the newspaper that was previously published. So you could say, you know, I noted with interest this article about solar, uh, you know, the opening of a solar array school um, and then pivot to the, the question um, to, to the bill at hand. Uh, they like to keep a conversation going about things they've published. Okay, and then I want to talk about writing and giving testimony. So as I said in the process of a bill, um, uh, you can uh, give testimony by emailing it to the committee, right? The bill's going to get a hearing and, uh, and uh, the way to do this is to uh, find out who the committee clerk is, and uh, Autumn can help you do this, or you can look it up online. Uh, and then you want to email short testimony. You do not want lengthy testimony again. Uh, one to two pages is what we would recommend. And you ask with a little cover note that the testimony be distributed to committee members. And so that's an easy way for them to forward it. Uh, again, you want to tell your personal story. The more specific, the better. Let's say you're a solar homeowner. You want to say, you want to talk about the experience that you had um, uh, installing solar, what the benefits are, particularly to you, to your pocketbook. You could refer to your, your bill and how much money you're saving. You can talk about the installer who came and three people who are on your roof uh, working to, locally uh, with a decent job. Um, and we need more of this sort of thing. Um, telling your story is is the way to go. Um, usually, if you have, you can come to the legislature and give oral testimony. You want to, you sort of want to start with your written testimony and then edit it to make it more natural when delivering it and reading it. So it's perfectly fine to, to read what you have. It's also perfectly fine just to go up and tell your personal story. Uh, uh, I usually like to work off of something. Um, usually, it depends on the committee and what the committee chair wants, but 
Oral testing is usually restricted to around two, three, four, you know, something like that. And you want to find out ahead of time. Audits can give you that information for that particular committee. But that's not a lot of time to you. Um, you want to also bring enough copies of your written testimony uh, to pass out to community members just before you speak. This is often a requirement uh, back in the days when nobody had you know, email. And still, it, this, this sort of convention still, still, still is around. Um, and again, um, we're here to help you figure all that out. Uh, you know, how many copies to make and all that kind of detail. So I'm going to stop now and be glad to talk um, more about specific questions you have about citizen lobbying. There's a lot more to be said about it. Uh, I hope this was a useful overview and you know, sort of a practical guide. Get going and inspire you to take one of those actions that we talked about. And I'd be glad to talk more about it. Um, but I want to turn it back to Autumn to um, talk about what's going on and what you're actually going to be lobbying for in uh, West Virginia. Autumn? Thank you, Glenn. Yeah, I hope you all found that overview helpful. And just to reiterate, if you have specific questions or comments um, about the suggestions and tactics that Glenn has suggested over the course of this webinar, click on that Q&A button on the bottom bar here and um, submit your question to us that way. We will answer them and you can also use the chat feature to chat with us more casually. But if you submit a question with that Q&A button, then we'll be sure to review and answer those at the end of the webinar. Um, so, moving on to what is going on here in West Virginia today um, and this winter, we scheduled this webinar at this point in time purposefully because the West Virginia legislature is in session and so this is um, prime time to be interacting with the legislators in Charleston as they are deliberating on and considering bills that can impact the state's solar owners and supporters and markets. Um, one bill in particular that Solar United Neighbors is deeply involved in advocating for um, would legalize power purchase agreements in West Virginia. And some of you may have seen our um, our correspondence and updates about the bill and action alerts to connect with your legislators in support of this bill. But just so we're all on the same page, we have developed a short video that explains what is a power purchase agreement. And so I figured that would be the best way to just uh, run through that quickly. So we'll just watch this video now and um, that should get us all on the same page about what is a power purchase agreement and how it would benefit West Virginia. So, so a PPA or power purchase agreement, uh, we use a lot of acronyms in the solar industry. So PPA is one of them. And it's, it's a, effectively a financing mechanism for energy projects like solar, wind, biomass. It's a way to finance these projects. A third party developer installs, owns, and operates an energy project on a host customer's property. And then the customer purchases the electric output from that system. So this is a way for the customer to lower their utility bills by buying power from that on-site system. PPAs can benefit all sorts of entities in West Virginia, homes and businesses and tax exempt entities. And they allow consumers to lower their energy costs and lock in rates over the long term to avoid future utility rate hikes. They aren't currently legal in West Virginia. So we are running a bill um, to make sure that they are legal in the future. So we're asking folks to contact their lawmakers and our coalition, the West Virginians for Energy Freedom, is uh, the, the coalition we're using to head up this effort. So this isn't just Solar United Neighbors doing this. This is a broad coalition of organizations and businesses and municipalities throughout the state. 
uh, working together to try and make PPAs legal. So to that end, um, there is a bill that has been introduced in the Senate. It's Senate Bill 409. As, uh, as Glenn mentioned earlier, that bill number is you know, important to reference in your correspondence and communications with legislators. This bill would specifically legalize power purchase agreements for on-site renewable and alternative energy facilities. So they would have to be located on the customer's property, such as a solar array, a landfill, biomass at a municipal landfill, uh, et cetera. And this bill has attracted uh, very strong bipartisan support and sponsorship. We're excited to have a really strong uh, slate of Senate leadership sponsoring this bill both Republicans and Democrats, and it is very likely to appear on the Senate Energy Industry and Mining Committee agenda this week. One of the challenges about um, legislative advocacy in West Virginia is that our legislative session is so short. Um, we have a 60 day regular session. So that really minimizes the amount of time advocates have available to meet with their representatives in Charleston and to focus on pushing through bills that they want to see made into law. Um, and because of that short time frame and kind of the scramble that always goes on during every legislative session, um, it's you get very little notice about when bills are going to appear on which committee agendas. Just getting a bill on a committee agenda is a really important first step because it's the chair of that committee who decides what's going to be heard on that committee's agenda. And it's advocates like us and you who can help push that chair to put a specific bill on the agenda. So we have heard from our team in Charleston that the Senate Energy Industry and Mining Chair plans to put Senate Bill 409 on the committee agenda this week. Um, they meet Tuesdays and Thursdays, so it could be up as soon as tomorrow. And I'm really hoping I hear about that soon today. I've been watching and waiting to hear word whether the uh, committee chair has released the agenda for tomorrow yet. Um, I'll be traveling to Charleston to testify in the committee as soon as it's um, on the agenda. So, um, so that's where we're at right now with Senate Bill 409. And um, one way you can act very easily is by completing the action alert that we circulated to our network uh, late last week. Vote yes on 409. Clicking that link will uh, send an email to all the committee members on the Energy Industry and Mining Committee. It's always great if you can personalize the text of those action alerts. You know, we have a pre, um, we, we've pre-made a sort of model text for you to click, but if you can personalize that with your own information and as Glenn emphasized it's it's really important to tell your personal stories and how this would impact you or why you care about it so action alert clicking that action alert is one way to help and um, you can also contact your local legislators your delegates and senators in your local district regardless of whether they're on the specific committees or not they really care about hearing from their local constituents and in a small state like West Virginia, it doesn't take very many points of contact from local constituents to make a really big difference in how a legislator views an issue. When they hear from, you know, half a dozen or a dozen folks in their district about the same issue, they really do stand up and take notice of that. It puts it on their radar and just reiterating, you know, putting that bill number in their head and reiterating that local constituents support it is a really, um, a really important thing that we can all do as citizens and voters. 
So if you don't know who your local representatives are, you, there are links to the Senate and House of Delegates rosters, so you can find out their contact information, their capital phone numbers, their capital um, email addresses, and I always encourage you to give a call in addition to writing an email. Phone calls um, tend to be more impactful than emails. Um, Glenn also went through how impactful letters to the editor can be. And so if you are, uh, if you have a local newspaper in your area that you would be willing to write a letter to the editor in support of SB 409 mm -hmm. or for any other issue that you care about for that matter, um, that would be wonderful. If you want some points, you know, or some starting points with that, if you need help getting some general talking points going for a short letter to the editor. I'm happy to follow up with you on a case by case basis and ensure that you have the resources you need to write a successful letter to the editor of your local paper. Um, if you if you want to take it to the next level, this next suggestion is kind of like a big a big to do. But there are several municipalities around West Virginia with local advocacy groups um, asking their city councils in those municipalities to adopt a resolution in support of this legislation. We have a template that the Morgantown Green Team has developed. They uh, got that resolution on city council's meeting last week. I haven't heard back from them about how that meeting went yet, but um, asking your local city council or county commission to adopt a resolution of support can be a powerful demonstration of local support for an issue that legislators really take note of. So in addition to those um, specific suggestions um, that are kind of time sensitive as this specific bill moves through the legislature, I also encourage you to learn more about PPAs and about our coalition. Visit the website energyfreedomwv.org. You can t click on the action alert there. You can see who all is involved in the coalition. There's almost 40 organizations and businesses involved in our coalition to date and get updates about the media coverage and press um, activity that's going on around this campaign. Uh, I did mention already uh, municipalities. Um, if, you know, if you think your local um, city manager or mayor or city council would like to join the West Virginians for Energy Freedom Coalition. We are always looking for new co coalition members and the more our coalition grows, the more powerful and impactful it becomes. So your employer, your municipality, an organization that you're affiliated with, um, reach out to the leadership there and suggest that they visit the website and learn about West Virginians for Energy Freedom. This is a bipartisan coalition. Um, it's really about access and um, having choice and having comp competitive market access for energy in West Virginia. We advocate for ratepayers and um, make sure that everybody really has a fair playing field for affordable energy in this state. We also have the Facebook and Twitter if you want to connect with West Virginia's for Energy Freedom on social media. So those are ways to get involved in the coalition. Um, one, a couple more suggestions. Uh, we will be attending, we meaning me personally, I will be attending E-Day at the Capitol. That's the West Virginia Environmental Council's annual lobbying day. It's this Thursday, the 7th from 9 to 2. You can RSVP with the E-Council on their Facebook page um, and I will be there. We'll have a table set up. We'll be you know, meeting with legislators and learning about all the other issues that are on the table this legislative session. If you need help connecting with your representatives, if you want to, you know, get a meeting with them or present testimony and you have questions or need assistance with that, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And um, be sure to look for resources that we'll be putting out soon. This slide presentation will be available. Um, I see we had a question about that. Will this PowerPoint be available? Yes, we were going to make the recording of this webinar available um, 
uh, available uh, online after the webinar um, wraps up. And we also are working on a citizen lobbying guide that will be available in the near future. So those are some, those, that's the basic overview of what's going on in West Virginia right now. Um, and then how you can how you can get involved and act. So uh, if folks have questions for either Glenn or me, uh, use that Q and A bar to type those questions. And um, we had answered, yeah, we had answered the one about the West Virginia the PowerPoint, which we'll we'll be making available. Uh, and we also had a question about what types of energy resources PPAs would make available. The law, uh, or the bill, which is not yet a law, the bill as written would make PPAs available for renewable and alternative energy resources as defined by the West Virginia state legislators net metering regulations. Um, there's a pretty extensive list of energy uh, resource facilities that fall under the definition of renewable and alternative energy. Um, the main beneficiaries of these on-site power purchase agreements would be uh, would be solar, you know, first and foremost, because that's the most common type of energy generation that's distributed on people's uh, properties. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. Okay. Um, we've got a question about con what kind of concerns um, opposing PPAs we could potentially hear from a legislator. Um, the main opponents to this legislation are the utility companies in West Virginia. The utility companies are currently monopoly power generators. They don't have to compete with, uh, with anyone else in their service areas. And so anything that they see as competitive, um, they're not necessarily going to be supportive of that. That said, um, this legislation is a very narrow, specific focus for on-site energy production that exists within the current net metering regulations. Those regulations include capacity limits for project sizes, as well as overall capacity limits based on the utility's peak load demand, um, which is a very small percentage of their overall load. So this, um, this would not actually impact utility uh, customer load in a significant manner. It's a very small number of people who, um, have, who have so far gone solar or taken advantage of the state's net metering regulations. And even with on-site PPAs, um, it would be a small, small percentage of percentage of a percentage of the utilities overall load. So um, we feel that those concerns from the utilities are more based on their like ideological position of having a monopoly over power production and not based on um, like realistic concerns on the ground. Um, Concerns we might hear from legislators, honestly, we've had great support and positive feedback from all the legislators that we have, um, that we've reached out to and been in contact with about this bill. People really understand that this would help people control their energy costs, that it would give people options, and that it's a, it's a simple and easy to understand way to finance these types of projects. So uh, it also, it helps that it's not specifically for solar only, that there are other forms of energy that could also benefit from this bill that, um, that makes it appeal to a broader, uh, a broader slate in the legislature. Um, so we've got a question about states, other states that allow power purchase agreements. Um, there are at least 26 states in the nation that allow PPAs, uh, including 
Ohio, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. So almost all of our surrounding states allow this type of financing structure. And their solar industries are also a lot better developed than ours here in West Virginia. So this is an important way to grow the solar market, to allow more people to access solar and to grow the solar job industry and business opportunities and economic opportunities in West Virginia. And just uh, following up, let's see, PPAs, there's a question about PPAs for biomass or uh, co-fired coal generation. So the current definition of renewable and alternative energy in West Virginia state code includes a pretty long list of power facilities, which does include um, biomass from landfill or wood pulp and also um, like certain types of clean coal technology that is not well defined and is probably not very realistic to deploy at this point but um, if you want more detailed information I'm, I'm sorry I don't I'm not able to list off the entire uh, list of every type of resource off the top of my head, but I do have that list in hand. So if you'd like to follow up to know exactly what resources um, are considered renewable or alternative energy under current West Virginia state law, be happy to follow up with you on that. And I think that covers most of the questions. Glenn, did you have any other follow-ups for folks? Um, no, not really. Um, I'd be interested to know um, how many people uh, have lobbied their legislature. Um, and um, that would be my first question and uh, what their experience was like. Um, because that's the, uh, one of the things I forgot to say is that this is actually fun. Um, and this is not like taking your medicine. This is a, um, a kind of a, you know, it's not, it's not for everybody, of course. Not everybody likes to do this. But if you care about these changes, this is a very practical and meaningful way to, to do it. Um, and I think most people who do lobby, um, they, they enjoy the experience, right? They particularly when you, you, you end up um, influencing that vote and you have a win. I mean, it's just, it's just a great feeling that, uh, you know, people have a sense you can't, you know, there's a cynical view out there that you can't make a difference. And I, it's, it's absolutely not true. People can make a difference. Um, so I'd just be curious uh, how many people, maybe in the Q&A section, people could type in whether they have lobbied, or lobbied successfully or, had a bad experience, you know, a good experience. I'd be very curious. I don't see any responses to that. So I think that means no one on the calls has lobbied before. Uh, maybe, maybe that I shouldn't assume that, but that's what I'll, I'll take it at. So I, I, if that's the case, I think, um, you should take advantage of this opportunity, um, to get started. We're hope we're hoping that this can spark your interest in, in doing this. If you haven't done it before, um, if you can make the lobby day this Thursday, that's a great way to get started. You get some training, you're doing it with other people. Uh, the energy is good when you do that. Um, if you can't make it, your schedule doesn't allow you to, you know, take a bunch of hours off during the, a work day, uh, which is totally understandable, then uh, I'm sort of asking everyone here to consider taking one of the steps, the citizen lobbying steps that we talked about. Even if you just pick up the phone or send a quick email, um, that'd be great. And if you really would like to, to make a difference, schedule a meeting with your legislator we could also try to connect you with other citizens who may want to go to that same meeting 
And so if you don't want to go alone, sometimes that can be a, a little intimidating. So let us know, and I hope, I hope this sparks your interest, and uh, let us know what we can do to support your, your efforts. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I guess if, if there are no more questions, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap up. We're at about 12.52, so this was pretty good timing. Um, I hope you all found this helpful and uh, happy to follow up on a case-by-case -case basis with any further questions or comments or feedback you would like to, uh, to let us know about. And I'll look forward to seeing you all in Charleston or somewhere around the state soon. So thanks for taking your lunch hour and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. We appreciate your support here at Solar United Neighbors. Thanks very much.